They called them the Ancient Ones. Hunters and farmers who once roamed the canyon lands of the American Southwest. They made pottery and arrowheads and little cities of hardened mud. But other than that, we cannot know them. What stories did they tell? How were they governed? Whom did they worship? We can only guess, for they only spoke to each other, never to us. They had no way to transform spoken words into written language, to pass on their heritage to future generations. Their history and their wisdom died with them. The story of civilization is very much the story of communications. Of course, all animals communicate with one another through body language, sounds, scents, or movement. But when men and women first discovered spoken language, it was an extraordinary moment, one that placed humans apart from all other living things. Only trouble is we don't know when this great moment took place or where. Probably it was here in East Africa, where we found evidence of early humans who lived in what is now the Old Dubai Gorge over three million years ago. But other than bones and footprints, they left no record. It wasn't until fairly recently in human history that people figured out ways to record simple events and ideas through pictures and symbols. This is a wall of ancient graffiti called Newspaper Rock in southern Utah. Some people think it was some sort of an ancient bulletin board or message center for the Anasazi Indians who made these pictoglyphs, as we call them, as much as 12,000 years ago. And we can only guess at their purpose. But certainly, the Anasazi knew what they meant. This was not the first form of graphic or visual communications. There are earlier, simpler examples going back as far as 35,000 years. Here, near Lascaux, France, four boys discovered a cave that led to a prehistoric art gallery. These paintings, and others nearby, were produced 15 to 35,000 years ago. Though long dead, the artist still speaks to us. He tells us what kinds of animals roamed Europe during his lifetime. This one possibly tells a story. The man is being gored by a wounded buffalo who has been pierced with a spear. But what of the bird perched atop another spear? And why is the rhinoceros only partly finished? Other symbols, such as groups of dots or human handprints, obviously meant something, but what? These prehistoric Picassos had a long way to go to communicate graphically, but it was a start. The paintings, by the way, no longer look the way they do in these old films made a half century ago. Visiting tourists ruined just by breathing on them what had survived for 50 centuries or more. But no matter. The cave artist continues to speak to us because thousands of years later, Others perfected the processes of printing and photography, which amplified and preserved these fragile works from so long ago. A lot had to happen, though, between the time when the first cave artist started to paint and Johann Gutenberg began to print. I mean, you can say one picture is worth a thousand words, but what if you wanted to express an idea or a short story or a poem? Then what was needed was a way to convey words and sentences. Well, that was invented here, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in what is now Iraq. Then it was called Mesopotamia. The history books refer to it as the cradle of civilization, and certainly it was no coincidence that civilization was born at the same time people learned how to write. 
Here at the University of Pennsylvania's University Museum are kept some of the few surviving artworks from that faraway time nearly 5,000 years ago when civilization got its jump start. They were uncovered in an archaeological dig sponsored by the university and the British Museum in the 1920s. The scientists discovered a royal cemetery where the kings and queens of ancient Sumer were buried. They were called the death pits, and for a very good reason. At the royal funeral, herds of cattle, horses, soldiers, wives, and servants followed the ruler's body into the pit. There they were either killed or took poison, probably voluntarily, to follow the monarch in death. Buried for 50 centuries, the pits finally gave up their terrible secret. They also revealed a civilization of great creativity and exquisite craftsmanship. A gold crown designed for a queen. Musical instruments decorated in precious stones. A strange but beautiful sculpture of a goat nibbling leaves. The scientists called it the ram in the thicket. But the archaeologists also uncovered other, less glittering treasures. In the ruins of ancient palaces throughout the region, they found thousands of little hardened clay tablets with inscriptions on them. Cuneiform, the world's first example of true writing. This one is a receipt. Somebody had bought some gazelles to sacrifice in the temple. Others told stories similar to those in the Bible, but written hundreds of years earlier. Here, for the first time, people could write letters to one another. We also know that they wrote splendid literature, for we found a wonderful epic poem of heroes and monsters, the first masterpiece of recorded history. Recorded history. It first happened here. These were literally the foundation stones of civilization. For when we learned to write, to do more than just paint pictures or picture symbols, we can pass on knowledge like passing on a stone. After 35,000 years of living in caves and grubbing for food, humans started coming up with all kinds of ideas, like making laws, putting up buildings, inventing a system of buying and selling, ideas built upon other ideas, and for the first time, human progress, in the modern sense, started to happen. It was also starting to happen along another riverbank, the Nile, a little later perhaps, but much more dramatically and more successfully. Egypt was more than just a civilization. She was the first great empire. Today, the remnants of her grandeur lie crumbling in the desert sands, but her gifts to us survive through agriculture, engineering, the clock, the calendar, and great art. Like prehistoric man, the Egyptians also painted on caves, but these were man-made caverns, and the messages were not vague and obscure like those at Lascaux. Instead of abstract wildlife paintings, the Egyptians gave us pictures of gods and goddesses and a guide to life after death. This is the Valley of the Kings near ancient Thebes. It's called the City of the Dead because here, the pharaohs of Egypt were buried in elaborate tombs carved in living rock. Some reach hundreds of feet into the earth. They were originally sealed with rubble, but that didn't stop the tomb robbers from stripping them bare. Miraculously, most of the royal mummies were rescued in ancient times by the priests and rest today in the Cairo Museum. But little else remains. Only one tomb, that of the boy king Tutankhamun, eluded the thieves. Yet there still is treasure in these ancient chambers and passageways. The walls and ceilings are alive with images and colors over 3,000 years old. They continue to speak to us of a long ago world. Since the pharaohs were considered gods, their tombs contain only pictures of fellow gods but here, on the walls of other tombs, 
those of the landowners, priests, and state officials, are charming scenes of court dances, crocodile hunts, fishing expeditions, feasts, and farming. They tell us more about this lost civilization than anything we find in the elaborate tomb chambers of the kings. But the Egyptians also gave us thoughts as well as images. The Egyptians, you see, developed their own system of writing called hieroglyphics. Here at the great temple of Karnak, they worshiped the sun god and inscribed all over these walls in hieroglyphs, proclamations glorifying the pharaoh and the god. They were quite an improvement over cave paintings or pictoglyphs or even the cuneiform from Mesopotamia. Some fragments of Egyptian poetry and prose have survived, but most weren't written on stone. They were written on paper, the world's first. Here along the banks of the Nile grew a plant called papyrus. For years we thought it was extinct, but it was rediscovered some time ago, and this ancient form of paper making has been revived. Strips of the plant were pounded and laid crosswise, then pressed together as paper, the same principle we use today, though the fibers are much smaller. The downside is that it's pretty brittle stuff. The material eventually rotted or crumbled into dust. Very little remains. Did Egypt have a Shakespeare? We don't know. What little has come down to us indicates that these people were wonderful composers of words and stories. But most of what they wrote, except for the names and the dates and the battles we see carved on these boastful stones, has vanished. After 2,000 years of empire, Egypt finally fell and Rome took her place at the center of the world stage. The Romans have had a bad press. Hollywood invariably pictures them as brutal villains relentlessly persecuting the Christians, though few emperors actually did. Even Rome's own historians seem more interested in dishing dirt than reporting on accomplishments. Theirs is frequently the stuff of supermarket tabloids, which is probably why they're so much fun to read. Today, not much remains of the glorious palaces of the Caesars, just this jumble of ruins high atop the Palatine Hill. On one side is the Roman Forum, with its temples, law courts, and markets. And on the other, all that remains of the great Circus Maximus. It was the setting for the chariot race in Ben-Hur. From his terrace, the emperor had a bird's eye view. Or, if he liked, he might stage his own private circus here in this little stadium, built right into the palace grounds. Here were horse races, animal shows, and fights to the death by gladiators. But the Romans were interested in more than just sports and games. Somewhere within these ruined palaces were the emperor's private libraries. The Romans, you see, knew that knowledge was power, and knowledge came from books. Even without printers, the books were cheap and numerous, at least during the empire period. Lots of people who knew how to write were willing to copy a book in exchange for food. So popular was the book trade that some bestsellers were released in editions of 100,000 copies, and each one had to be written out by hand. Yet the cost of a book in ancient times was little more than a printed one today. And it wasn't just the emperors who had them. Many people had libraries in their homes. And for those who couldn't afford their own books, there were the public libraries. This is all that's left of the great public baths of the Emperor Caracalla. It was an immense pleasure palace, one of the few accomplishments of an otherwise tyrant who ended up being assassinated by his own troops. These Roman baths were about more than just keeping clean. They were like public social clubs, Rome's answer to the YMCA or the YWCA, since women were admitted in the mornings, men in the afternoons. They were history's largest health clubs, with exercise rooms and workout areas, even a shopping mall. Imagine these walls covered in marble, with expensive tapestries, paintings, and mosaics. You can still see some of them here on the floor of what used to be a swimming pool. 
The Romans believed it was as important to exercise the mind as the body. And so, after a dip in the pool, many a Roman would stroll across the garden into one of the great libraries that were an integral part of these structures. This is what remains of Caracalla's Latin library. Here, the citizen could relax with a book of poetry or a good comedy. He might do some research or study philosophy. You could even check out a book and take it home. The emperors may have been corrupt, but the people were well educated and had a thirst for knowledge. And this was the secret of Rome's endurance. She was the world's most powerful nation for almost 800 years. It ended finally after a slow death lasting two centuries. At last in 410, the eternal city fell to barbarian invaders. The great baths were stripped of their treasures. The statues were melted down. Public buildings were destroyed and the libraries and their books were burned. This great body of knowledge accumulated over a thousand years of Greek and Roman civilization was lost. The Dark Ages had begun. The Dark Ages were a period of many hundreds of years in which nothing happened. Well, of course, some things happened. People were born, they got married, they farmed the land, and they died. But except for the slow rise to power of the medieval church, nothing really significant occurred. No important scientific discoveries, no medical breakthroughs or inventions, no great ideas in government or laws that bettered the human condition. And this went on for almost 1,000 years. And there was one simple reason for it. People were ignorant. Schools were practically non-existent, so people couldn't read. And those who could read or wanted to learn something found there really wasn't much to learn. The barbarians had gutted the storehouse of knowledge. They couldn't read themselves, so they had no use for the books in the libraries. And they destroyed them. Well, not quite all. This is the great cathedral of Gloucester, England. In the Middle Ages, it was a monastery one of many established in Europe and the British Isles. Here in these cloisters, many of the surviving writings of Greece and Rome were collected and copied over and over again by monks who labored in little writing rooms called scriptoriums. Theirs was a precious treasure. The church knew it, and so did the rich and powerful rulers of the day, the kings and nobles, who came to the monastery seeking knowledge and counsel from these humble churchmen. You see, they knew the secret that Rome had learned so well, that those who have knowledge have power and influence, privilege and wealth. And so these people became more powerful, and the church did too, for the church held the keys to knowledge, locked away in these dusty writing rooms. They still survive here at Gloucester, these little cubby holes, these cubicles, where the monks sat patiently copying. We owe much to those who toiled here, and other ancient scribes before them, who formed a chain down through the ages. For a long time, the rulers kept the storehouse of knowledge to themselves, but gradually, people started wanting to learn again. They came here, to the monastery, and the monks did not turn them away. Instead, little schools sprang up within these walls, schools that later became public universities. A new interest in art, history, and science arose. It was what we today call the Renaissance, the rebirth of learning. But now, with the new thirst for knowledge, there weren't enough monks to keep up with demand. Professional manuscript writing became an industry. Today, many of these works are considered masterpieces, with elaborate decorations in jeweled colors of reds, blues, and liquid gold. But then suddenly, in the midst of the Renaissance, something happened that spelled doom insofar as the manuscript industry was concerned. More than that, it turned the world on its ear and propelled this rebirth of learning throughout Europe and beyond. The invention of printing.
We might have called him John Gutenberg. It was Johann, of course, for he was German, and he was one of the most influential men who ever existed. His invention he called artificial writing. We know it as printing. It was done on a machine Gutenberg adapted from a wine press and probably looked something like this. But there was more to his invention. Movable type, an idea previously invented by the Chinese. But because there were literally thousands of characters in their language, it was of little use and quickly abandoned in favor of carved wood blocks. But it worked perfectly for Gutenberg, for he had only 23 basic letters to deal with. That's how many there were in the Roman alphabet. And he did more than just recycle the Chinese idea. He invented a little gizmo, a mold, which could turn out metal types that were exactly the same height. And so, when the type was assembled and inked and pressed against paper, the result was clean, uniform, and highly readable. It was every bit as good as manuscript writing, but a lot faster. You might produce a hundred copies of a page in the time it took a scribe to make one or two. This is Gutenberg's first first edition here at the University of Texas in Austin. Gutenberg only printed the black letters. The colored accents, called rubrications, were added by others, as well as the elaborate borders, referred to as illuminations. It's an incredibly beautiful work, and it's easy to see why it gave the people in the manuscript business fits. Well, one would have thought this revolutionary new invention would have made Gutenberg a wealthy man. Unfortunately, the father of printing was more a craftsman than a businessman. Forced into bankruptcy, he died blind and penniless. But others kept the great presses turning, and artificial writing soon spread throughout the continent. At first, everyone was delighted. After all, books and pamphlets were now much more affordable. But remember, only a few people could read, just the scholars and the churchmen and some of the nobility. In other words, the wealthy. So to the average Joe, printing was just ink on paper, and that's the way they wanted it. They didn't want the average Joe to start reading the scriptures. What if Joe began to interpret them? What if he found something there that contradicted the official teachings? one of which said it was God's will that the poor remain poor and the rich get richer. Why, this might lead to revolutions. Well, it wasn't long before some brave souls started to translate the Bible into common languages. People began to read them and question what those in power had been telling them for years. Little pamphlets critical of the government or the church or the rulers began to appear. And as you might guess, this made the rulers very uncomfortable. Suddenly, the printer was someone to be feared. He could be dangerous and had to be controlled. This little park in a noisy London business district is one of the bloodiest spots in all of England. In the old days, it was known as Tower Hill because it was located just a stone's throw from the Tower of London, the famous fortress and dungeon built here 1,000 years ago. It was here on this spot that the condemned were brought out from the tower and publicly executed. People would turn out by the thousands to see it. In those days, there were no TV shows or video arcades, so execution day was like a public holiday. Promoters bought up seats and sold them to the spectators. The price, depending on the seat location, and who the star attraction was to be, sort of like rock concerts today. Many of those executed were thieves and murderers. Others were political prisoners who confessed under torture. Many were printers who used the powerful instrument, the press, to express unpopular opinions. One such man was John Twin, the most popular printer in London. He dared to print a pamphlet that was critical of the court system of the day, and for this, he had to die a traitor's death. Most people simply got the ax, but not traitors like Printer John. His sentence was to be hung, carried out not like today with a quick break to the neck, 
but a slow strangulation that might last 30 minutes or so. And then Printer John was lowered to the ground and still living, hacked to pieces. His body parts were stuck up on spikes around the city of London as a warning to other printers who might express an unpopular opinion in print. John Twin had dared to criticize the judges. Two other printers had their hands cut off because they printed a rumor that Queen Elizabeth I might be getting married. But most of the violations had to do with statements regarding religion. This is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome the world's largest house of worship. To pay for it, Pope Julius sold indulgences, forgivenesses for sins often paid in advance. One who took exception to this was Martin Luther, a German priest who broke with his church over this and other issues. Tradition tells us he hammered his words of protest onto the door of Wittenberg Cathedral in 1517. If so, they wouldn't have stayed up there very long. We do know that a copy fell into the hands of a printer, and it wasn't long before Luther's ideas were being read and debated by people all over Europe. With each turn of the spindle, the pamphlets of protest electrified the Western world and ignited the Protestant Reformation. It raged for centuries, its fires fed by the blood of martyrs, both Catholic and Protestant alike, and by ink from the press. Purges and persecutions rocked the continent. The Inquisition, witch trials, peasant revolts. Even today, in some parts of the world, the conflict is not totally resolved. When the dust settled, there was no longer just one church, but many. More important, religious freedom had been established as a basic human right. The Catholic Church survived and it might be argued that the Reformation actually saved it because it became less political and more spiritual. And Pope Julius's dream of a new St. Peter's became a reality as well. It took 200 years to build, is almost as tall as the Great Pyramid, and is filled with some of the world's most famous masterpieces. The story is told of a tourist who was being shown around St. Peter's by an old priest. After the tour, the tourist asked, how much must all this have cost? The old priest replied sadly, it cost the Reformation. And so it did, but without the printer, it might not have happened. When Gutenberg invented printing around 1450, the world was a strange place indeed. Common folk believed it was flat. Sailors thought there were sea monsters in the far oceans, and maps of the time included such locations as the Garden of Eden, and included drawings of curious beast men who were thought to inhabit the unknown territories. One man, studying the ancient Greek maps and atlases, came to believe that the world was round and that you might sail west and end up in China. He was right, but he grossly miscalculated the size of the earth. Had Columbus known its true circumference, he'd never have set out on his historic voyage. But he did, of course, and bumped into America. His was the age of discovery. Aided by the printing of new atlases, other sea captains set out in search of trade routes, Within 50 years of Columbus's landfall, the earth was still a strange place, for truth proved stranger than myth, and the Europeans yearned to learn more of the curious lands, peoples, creatures, and customs they never knew existed. Others were drawn not by curiosity, but by greed. They were called the conquistadors, and they came in search of gold and glory, offering first friendship, then death. For years, they were celebrated as heroes, Cortez in Mexico, Pizarro in Peru. Today, they stand accused as villains who came murdering and destroying, the new barbarians, the educated ones. Their victims, many of them, were no less savage. 
The Aztecs, the Mayas, and others practiced human sacrifice and even cannibalism. The Inca rulers maintained a class society where a nation of poor served a handful of rich. Slavery, too, was very much a part of many pre-Columbian cultures. There was no shortage of villains among the conquerors or the conquered. It could be argued that the worst sin of the conquistadors was that of the barbarians, the destruction of a culture and its accumulation of knowledge. Remember the Roman bronzes melted down by the barbarian invaders? The art of ancient America met a similar fate. Cortez destroyed the great city of the Aztecs. These ruins in downtown Mexico City are all that remain of the great temple pyramid where human sacrifices once took place. Other, much older civilizations were abandoned long before, and it is from their ruined remains that we get most of our scant knowledge of ancient America. Teotihuacan. Its great pyramids, covered in rubble, were finally excavated in the 20th century. For years, many people assumed they were mountains. And here, deep in the jungles of Chiapas, the Maya based its empire, then abandoned it and moved on. It was a rich heritage, going back before the time of Christ. Yet, within the space of two years, most of it was gone. And the history, the books, the literature, did the ancient Americans have a written body of knowledge? Well, some did. They were called codices, highly developed picture writing, almost all of it put to the torch by the Spanish, who knew only too well that to destroy a civilization, you need only destroy its written record. Well, since there were no printers around, there were very few of the precious manuscripts, and these were burned in public bonfires. But the printer did come. His name was Juan Pablos, this first printer in North America. He arrived in 1539 and set up his press in Mexico City. He printed religious materials for the Spanish friars come to convert the Indians. Other printers followed, and Mexico became a printing center. It would be a hundred years, though, before printing reached what is now the United States. This was Jamestown the first English settlement in the New World, established in 1607. The original Jamestown is out there somewhere, washed away by the James River, but a recreated version dramatizes the harsh life experienced by these first colonists. There was little need for printing. They had enough to do clearing the forests, planting crops, and dealing with harsh winters. It would be 75 years before a printer came to Jamestown, and he was chased away by the governor on orders of the king. They weren't about to have printers, like John Twin, stirring up things here in Virginia. Elsewhere, though, printers got a warmer reception in New England, New York, and Philadelphia. The first known printing was a one-page oath from around 1638 in Massachusetts. No copy survives, and if you happen to find one, it's worth millions of dollars. But we do have the first book printed in colonial America. This book of Psalms, printed by Matthew Day in 1640. Later came prayer books, almanacs, Bibles, sermons, lesson books, and newspapers, all produced on wooden presses like this one at Williamsburg. Yes, colonial Virginia did finally get a printer, over 100 years after the first settlers arrived. By that time, the new world had grown radically apart from the old, and the colonial press helped drive the wedge even further. It was a stamp tax on printing paper that first sparked rebellion. A brilliant political essay, attacking in print the institution of kingship, brought to the lips of the common man the whispers of revolution. And Jefferson's eloquent letter of resignation to King George published throughout the colonies in newspapers and broadsides, astonished the world with the concepts of inalienable rights and self-government. The surrender of the British at Yorktown signaled not just an end to the war, but the dawn of a new era in world government. 
an era in which printers, Isaiah Thomas, Robert Aitken, Benjamin Franklin, and scores of others took leading roles. Other revolutions followed. The French Revolution established the concept of fundamental rights for all people, a true revolution of ideas. Most of these were proclaimed and debated through the printing press, in newspapers, posters, and pamphlets. The press was now a powerful instrument for change. This novel by a New England housewife became an international bestseller and swayed public opinion against the institution of slavery. A shy professor's science book sparked a controversy over evolution that still rages. A book on astronomy by Galileo condemned him to the Inquisition, but also brought about a new understanding of our universe. So now there are whole buildings full of knowledge and ideas, such as here at the Library of Congress. More than any one person could possibly absorb or remember. It's no longer necessary to reinvent or rediscover. It's all here, this great harvest of human wisdom growing by the day, miles of bookshelves, millions of volumes, billions of ideas. More than that even, the very pages of history, yesterday's newspapers and magazines containing eyewitness accounts of some of the greatest moments in human history as they were recorded for the very first time. Here, a forgotten brawl in a saloon on the western frontier or a skirmish between colonists and Indian tribes that occurred early in America's infancy. Classified ads from another time enable us to capture the flavor of life as it was lived long ago. Of course, we haven't always had newspapers and periodicals. Gutenberg never printed a newspaper. He never even read one because they hadn't been invented yet. There was just word of mouth or the legendary town crier to spread the news. Then printers started selling little booklets called newsbooks, which dealt with one single event. Later, they started to print several stories in the same issue. And finally, true news sheets, the first newspapers in the modern sense, were born. This is where the first newspaper publishers first set up their shops, at the wharf. When the ships would come in, the printer would rush out to meet them and interview the captain and the crew to find out what was happening in America or Europe or elsewhere. And then he would publish those reports in his news sheets. Of course, since the ships might be out of port for as long as several years, the news was oftentimes somewhat out of date. But without the telephone, telegraph, and mass transportation, that was about the best they could hope for. Later, as newspapers became more common, Printers in America quit relying so much on the reports of sailors. They would simply reprint stories from the English and European papers as they arrived at port. But the American newspaper printers were not just copycats. They broke new ground insofar as freedom of the press was concerned. For years, printers who were thought to promote dangerous ideas might have their presses burned or themselves publicly flogged. In 1735, a printer named John Peter Zenger tested this tradition when he dared to criticize New York's corrupt Governor Cosby in his newspaper. Zenger was thrown into jail, later to be hauled up before a kangaroo court. But his lawyer was so persuasive, he actually convinced the stacked jury to set Zenger free. For the first time, the idea of press censorship had been attacked. Freedom of the press soon became a reality, leading, as we've seen, to the American Revolution. After independence, newspapers became more popular than ever. The telegraph made it quicker and easier to gather the news from across the continent. Faster steamships and clipper ships reduced transatlantic crossings so foreign news could be picked up more quickly. Daniel Craig, a printer's apprentice, came up with the idea of sailing out to meet the ships offshore and sending back news summaries by carrier pigeon, thereby scooping the competition. Nothing impacted newspapers like the Civil War. People were desperate for news, and for the first time there were full-time professional reporters and journalists. Illustrated newspapers, like the great Harper's Weekly, 
brought the war into homes across America with eyewitness sketches transformed into wood engravings. Other new technologies increased the demand for printing and particularly newspapers. The light bulb, for example. People were suddenly reading more because they had more light to read by in their leisure hours. The telephone in 1877 greatly improved the gathering of news. The typewriter reduced the time necessary to prepare it for publication. Then came photography. At first, editors redrew the photographs as artists' illustrations. But then, using a system of tiny dots, printers created the halftone, and photos became as important as words in the pages of the newspaper. The political cartoon entered its golden age. Harper's hired the legendary Thomas Nast, who used humor to attack corruption in government. Along the way, he created the Democratic Donkey, the Republican Elephant, Uncle Sam, and our modern visualization of Santa Claus. Around 1890, the New York world started to print in color. Yellow was particularly hard to reproduce. So to show off, the newspaper introduced a rather ugly character called the Yellow Kid, who became the first comic strip hero. Later, strips were reprinted and sold separately, giving rise to the comic book industry. Not only was the news gathered more quickly, but it was being printed faster too. Higher speed newspaper presses were developed. Still, a lot of time was lost just setting the type, which was done by hand, much as Gutenberg had done it four centuries before. So, in 1887, Otmar Mergenthaler invented the linotype machine, which cast letters on the spot and arranged them for printing at the command of a keyboard operator. It is considered one of the greatest inventions of all time, transforming not just the newspaper, but the entire printing industry, and was in use for a hundred years. Other innovations followed. William Morris, called the father of modern printing, saw print as not just ink on paper, but a thing of beauty in its own right. Printers suddenly became concerned about quality. Typefaces became more elegant. Images became sharper. Color printing got better and better. Competing communications technologies arose. Radio, television. They only enlarged our methods of communications, and printing continued to grow. Computers came along, and some people said Gutenberg was a has-been. We'd soon have a world without print. It didn't happen. In some cases, such as legal encyclopedias, they moved from print to computer screens. But by and large, books, and magazines, newspapers, manuals, packaging, all continued to mushroom. In fact, desktop publishing has made printing more affordable and more exciting. So the last laugh still belongs to Gutenberg. Though the technologies have changed, printing continues to preserve the past, record the present, and help invent the future. More than that, Gutenberg's invention has made knowledge the property of every man and every woman. Well, not quite. Unfortunately, this great treasury of knowledge is available only to those people who can read and a disturbing trend is that more and more people cannot. Just as in Roman times, or in the Dark Ages, when the rich and the powerful were those who were literate, well, the same holds true today. The scientists, the politicians, the inventors, the doctors and lawyers and sports writers and bosses continue to be those people who can read. It's always been so, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Welcome to Cal Poly's Graphic Communication Department in San Luis Obispo, California. My name is Harvey Levinson. Harvest of Wisdom was first produced in 1994. And as you have doubtless noticed before digital high definition television was available, a lot of progress has been made in the graphic communication industry as well. And I am honored to represent Nolan Moore in this update as he was one of the great intellects of our profession but unfortunately no longer with us today to tell the rest of the story. 
We are in the Graphic Communication Department's Electronic Publishing Laboratory. In this laboratory, we have some of the latest imaging hardware and software available. Nolan Moore pointed out that desktop publishing has increased the need for printing and made it more exciting. Indeed, it has. Who ever thought that since 1994, we would evolve through technologies of CDs and DVDs, numerous generations of desktop and laptop computers, on-demand and variable data printing? Who ever thought that databases would be part of the knowledge requirement of printers, or that the skills of information technology would become the required skills of printing and related graphic communication industry professionals. The advancements of inkjet printing, multimedia including images, motion, and sound, and non-print digital imaging has changed the scope and products of the graphic communication industry in ways that were previously part of science fiction. The internet and the World Wide Web have become part of the DNA, the nucleus of graphic communication in ways previously never imaginable. Desktop publishing has made the content creator the media producer, whether a business person, a student, a stay-at-home mom or dad, a member of a social or service organization, every person can now be in the business of graphic communication, mass communication, and one-to-one -one communication using the technology of desktop publishing. Today, social media has made this even more possible. The internet and the World Wide Web have impacted nearly every segment of traditional printing. However, these impacts have been positive because now, through modern technology, the impact of printing as the most pervasive, detailed, influential, and informative form of mass communication has been enhanced. For example, packaging is one of the largest segments of the graphic communication industry. In packaging, we are now seeing interactive packaging. Radio frequency identification has enhanced inventory control, product identification, pricing control, and so on. Augmented reality has provided the opportunity to visualize what products will look like on store shelves or in the home. Near field communication built into smartphones, replace credit cards, paper tickets, loyalty cards for in-store purchasing, and so on. It involves a Wi-Fi style, short range, low power wireless link evolved from radio frequency identification technology that can transfer small amounts of data between two devices held a few centimeters from each other. Quick response codes has enabled the consumer to explore product producers, websites to learn more about product contents, nutritional information, special offers, and so on. 3D printing has enabled the production of product and package prototypes. The technology of inkjet printing has emerged in quality and speed in recent years to compete with offset lithography. Here we have a Zante wide format digital inkjet printer that prints at a rate of 12 inches per second. It's driven by a Memjet engine having over 2,000 print heads that extend across the width of the sheet. No longer is it necessary to wait minutes or sometimes hours to print posters, banners, and other large size display items. Toner systems have advanced in quality and speed and sizes to compete with traditional printing. Toner printing systems such as those produced by Kanaka Benolta, Rico, HP, Osei, Xerox, and others have refined what a printing press looks like and how it performs. With uh, these systems, a file is fed in one side and a printed bound full color booklet or magazine can come out of the other side and it could be for a run of one. No longer are long setups required or paper wasted at the startup. While traditional printing such as offset lithography, flexography, gravure, and screen printing will have its place in the industry for a long time to come, digital toner and inkjet systems will continue to grow 
to serve the need for short run and variable data personalized printing. Nunprint Digital Imaging has now found its way into the graphic communication company of today and will continue to grow in the future. Printers and publishers that survive and grow will find themselves needing to diversify their product offerings for existing and new clients. No longer will traditional printing be enough to service market needs. Companies are beginning to offer full marketing services to their clients, including website development, graphic design, internet publishing, digital asset management, apps development, web to print, and print to web capabilities, and so on. The graphic communication industry is evolving from a print and distribute workflow to a distribute and print workflow, where instead of printing thousands of documents and mailing them, or transporting them to recipients, one file is developed and transmitted to the thousands of recipients where they are reviewed electronically or printed on site where needed. Cloud computing will become the trusted procedure for secure file storage without occupying hard drive space on computers. Social media will become the preferred communication means replacing email, texting, blogging, online chatting, and even interactive gaming will continue to grow as a preferred form of expression and non-print digital communication. What is important to know is that all of these new forms of mass and personal communication now fall within the domain of the graphic communication industry and will live simultaneously with print services that continue to be needed. Mobile devices such as smartphones, electronic tablets, and the like are becoming the new substrate on which images appear. Notice how these devices become thinner and thinner with added image manipulation capabilities and increased battery capacity. The technology has been developed to enable web navigation on paper-thin substrates. The technology is called e-ink or e-paper. Developed a number of years ago by MIT Media Lab, and what was then Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, known as PARC. Microspheres of pigments are built into paper-thin substrates and images are created by electrostatic manipulation of the pigments. The day will come when you plug in yesterday's newspaper or news magazine to get today's news. Touch or point to access the web and navigate on paper as you would on a computer or plug in a novel you had just read on paper and the text of a new novel appears. This is all what the new graphic communication industry will offer. The design, the files, the uploading and downloading, the color management, the storage, the workflow, along with the printing services that will continue to be needed. Printed electronics and functional imaging is a growing area of the new graphic communication industry. Printing batteries, printing microprocessors, and even printing organic components of the human body is possible with printed electronics and functional imaging. Here at Cal Poly, we developed a master's degree program in this area. Nolan Bohr pointed out that Gutenberg's invention made knowledge the property of all people who can read. However, all new media have made more knowledge available to more people faster than ever. Print and non-print digital imaging will survive and grow together in serving the information needs of society. Studies point to print not going away, but remaining recognized as a favored medium for education, detail of information, and retention of information across generations, education levels, and occupations. The result of a recent Cal Poly study entitled, What Does Media Mean to You?, shows this result. How print is produced and distributed may change, but the effectiveness and value of an image on a substrate will not. Written communication was such an integral part of the advancement of civilization, and the fact is that electronic communication in all its forms is still writing. We came from writing on clay tablets to communicating in the cloud, and who knows the potential impact over the next few decades of devices such as Google Glass, where the spoken instruction provides an oral or written response. Writing has taken on a new meaning in how it is produced and distributed. 
The new ink, the new paper, will continue to play a role in distributing ideas and thoughts. And the printing press, in whatever shape or form it takes, will continue to be the symbol of freedom of speech and expression in a free world and democratic society. In the words of Charles Dickens, written in 1864, for an address to an anniversary meeting of the Printers Pension Society will live on. Dickens said, the printer is the friend of intelligence, of thought. The printer is the friend of liberty, of freedom, of law. Indeed, the printer is the friend of every person who is a friend of order, of all the inventions, of all the great results in the wonderful progress of mechanical energy and skill. The printer is the only product of civilization necessary to the existence of free people. Graphic communication technology of the past was largely mechanical in nature and developed by individual entrepreneurs. The new electronic technologies of today came largely from aerospace and defense. The present technologies of the printing, publishing, and related graphic communication industries evolved from such technologies. Lasers, microwave relays, satellite transmission, the internet, and the World Wide Web all filtered down from aerospace and defense and will continue to play a role in not only developing communication technologies, but in more efficient and effective ways of communicating as well. What of tomorrow? Will it too be a communications age, even as we look beyond the bounds of Earth and reach for the stars? Undoubtedly so. It began with Pioneer 10, threading its way through the solar system telling us more about our universe than we'd ever known before. Then the satellite took leave of Jupiter to plunge into deep space. Her transmitters would soon be extinguished, but the relic satellite would continue on. For a decade, it had sent its messages of discovery back to Earth, but no more. For the next billion years, it would seek only to communicate with alien beings somewhere in the stars. On its nose cone was a message. It told of the Earth and our solar system. It described the human men and women who lived here. It was a message in a bottle hurled into an ocean of stars. It's written in a language as old as communications itself. Picture writing. Not unlike the ancient pictoglyphs carved here on the walls of these canyons. Will Pioneer's message ever be received? And if so, will its meaning be understood? Or will it be as garbled and confusing as these symbols? There's another irony. Pioneer's next port of call is an obscure star called Ross 248, somewhere in the constellation Andromeda. There may be planets and life forms that might intercept the satellite and its cryptic message from Earth. Estimated time of arrival, about 35,000 years from now. An incredible amount of time? Perhaps. But perhaps not. For that's just about the number of years that have passed since our long ago ancestors inscribed on cave walls those first primitive efforts to communicate with the future. Mm -hmm.